The year is 1995. It's now been six years since WizKid Steven Soderbergh's Sex, Lies, and Videotape became a surprise smash hit, almost single-handedly creating a feeding frenzy for independent films. But while some of his peers are finding their footing, Soderbergh seems like he's losing his grip. His second and third films got mixed reviews, and more importantly in Hollywood, lost lots of money. Some directors never get a second chance, much less a third or fourth. How much time does he have? I don't want to say his career has bottomed out, because it might be worse than that. Mike, what's below the bottom? Uh, the underneath? Cinematic nominative determinism. I tell you, this whole thing could have been avoided with a more uplifting title. Welcome to the Filmographer's Podcast, the show where we study a director's entire career, one film at a time. I'm Kier Graf. And I'm Michael Morisi. We're interested in the big picture. This season, we're turning the spotlight on Steven Soderbergh, discussing why each of his films succeeded or failed, and we will get to successes soon. <laughs> and uh, we'll be looking at them in the context of the Hollywood landscape at the time that the film was released. Above all, we want to know how working artists make a life in the arts. We don't give lengthy plot summaries and we do share spoilers. We hope you'll subscribe to the pod, watch the films with us, and join us each week as we explore what makes Steven Soderbergh so fascinating in spite of, or maybe because of, the fact that he's so unpredictable. Before we examine the underneath his fourth feature film, Mike, please describe the plot in one sentence. Yeah, so here's what I got. A washed out gambler returns to his hometown to reconcile his past, but only ends up digging his hole even deeper when he gets involved with a heist that, you guessed it, goes terribly awry. When he gets his father-in-law killed, gets <laughs> shot, loses the money, and loses the girl. Man, that is just, uh, it's nor is it, it's at its finest. And I think in that summary, there are, there, it's interesting. We've, we've talked a lot about what makes Soderbergh Soderbergh and, you know, when the themes will kind of make themselves apparent. But in this film, for all its flaws, which we'll be getting to, uh, <laughs> there are some interesting echoes of films that came before and some foreshadowing of films that are to come. Uh, let me quickly give a little bit of background on kind of how the underneath came together. There's some stuff I don't know, but um, we can at least talk a little bit about where he is in his life and, and what was going on before he started filming. So Steven Soderbergh divorced his wife, Betsy Brantley, in 1994. They had gotten married in 1989. Their relationship came together kind of during the heady early days of his career. Things were flying high. Uh, he's since had a couple of movies that didn't do so well. And then maybe fittingly, his marriage also falls apart. He's talked a lot about his kind of emotional unavailability. And I don't know how deep of a dive we'll go into that, but he's well aware that he's a difficult person to live with. <laughs> Which is weird because you, you watch interviews with him. He seems so pleasant. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> like, I would like to hang out with Steven Soderbergh. And Steven, if you're listening... We're here. Give us a call. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He seems pleasant. He seems funny. He's obviously very self-aware, but then he, he talks again and again, again, about this early part in his life. So maybe he's uh, gone through therapy and made some big life changes since then. But yeah, sure. during this early part of his life, he just talks about how he doesn't know how to be with people. And clearly that was a problem in his marriage. Uh, his wife would talk about how he would disappear for long periods of time and then kind of come back and try to make the marriage work, but he didn't know how to do it. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, they both seem like great people, but apparently they weren't great together. So he had also spent much of the previous half dozen years living on the Virginia farm that he had bought, uh, I think shortly after Sex Lies, and where he'd hoped to be based. He was very ambivalent about LA and being an LA-based person, which is, I think, an important insight into his character. He wants to make movies. He wants to make movies with Hollywood, but he doesn't want to become a creature of Hollywood. However, it's not working out so great. He's written scripts in the old shed on his, on his farm. He's gone where he needs to go to make movies, but the movies haven't been doing well. His marriage has fallen apart. His state of mind 
is not great. Making things even worse is the fact that he was supposed to make a movie called Quiz Show. Some of you may be familiar with that. I never knew this before. I feel like I know a lot about Soderbergh and in our, you know, the research we've been doing, like digging deeper, that's something I never came across. And I'm just, fa I, I, a quiz show, I'll be honest, is one of my favorite movies of the 90s. Like I, I'm a sucker for movies that are like, the stakes are your morality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, um, oh, what's the Paul Newman, Sydney uh, Lumet? Uh, the Verdict. The Verdict, yeah. yeah. Where the stakes are about a person learning, you know, ethics and morality. Uh, and that's what quiz show is. You know, there's, there's really no villain, et cetera. But like, I love that movie. And I, I wonder so much about the version that Steven Soderbergh would have done and what his what his involvement. I mean, he would have been the director, but what his vision for that could have been. It's so fascinating. Yeah, that is a fascinating what if. And I wish that version of the movie existed on the you know, as a DVD extra on the, the actual yeah. <laughs> one that, that did. It's hard to, to know whether he could have improved it because he was obviously a, a difficult point in his career and still learning a lot as a director. He was, as he said, getting kind of more and more formal about his filmmaking, which wasn't necessarily a good thing for him during his first four films. But this, the story of how he got bumped off Quiz Show is kind of fascinating, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but I, like you, I didn't know that he had been part of that at all. But he, he was going to make it for Baltimore Pictures. The thing was coming together while he was making King of the Hill, which was produced by Robert Redford. Somebody, <laughs> the, the so I guess the, the assistant to the head of Baltimore Pictures is married to the head of Wildwood, which is Robert Redford's production company, he or she sent the script to um, Redford. Soderbergh gets a call while he's shooting King of the Hill, which is produced by Robert Redford, that Redford will now be directing Quiz Show. In journalism, that term is called bigfooting. So <laughs> <laughs> he got Sundanced. <laughs> he, got <laughs> <laughs> he got Redforded. Um, and so obviously that didn't go well. Redford's perspective, he claimed that uh, Soderbergh was taking too long to make King of the Hill. And so he wasn't able to be as involved uh, as he wanted as producer, which is why he removed his name as producer of King of the Hill. I think that that's maybe the diplomatic response. It seems like there was a bit of a falling out. Something happened there. There's a quote from Soderbergh. He says, the image that is given of Redford as being a friend of the filmmaker is not what I experienced. Yeah, that's... um. You know, when you when you make the Ocean's Eleven franchise, you can say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say that now. So anyway, he was looking for a project stat. He said, I was looking for something to do and this presented itself. Mike, do you know any more than that? I honestly, in my research, I was not able to find out more about how this script came to him. Yeah, I, I came across something interesting that Universal who who you know, uh, produced this film had sent him crisscross and they're like, Hey, basically it was like from what Soderbergh says is that they came to him and said, Hey, we're thinking about remaking this. Are you interested? And I think they found him as you're kind of describing in a moment, vulnerability, maybe it, it seemed like there was a little bit of an apathetic shrug of what the hell. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, it's a re remake of Robert C. Odemack's uh, Criss Cross, a 1948 noir starring Burt Lancaster and Yvonne DiCarlo, based on Don Tracy's 1934 novel Criss Cross. Uh, so, yeah, he just is like, well, it's in front of me. I guess I'll make it. The original Criss Cross, which I, I rewatched recently, is a, a good heist movie. It's a it's a good crime caper. It it's, moves along forward. There's a fantastic nightclub scene, and it's fun to see how Soderbergh updates the kind of nightclub setting of the original movie. However, instead of remaking it as a straightforward heist movie, Soderbergh decides to kind of do a more personal take on it, which we'll, we'll get into it. It's filmed uh, March through May 1994. It's made for Gramercy Pictures, the second film for Gramercy. I have a difficult time keeping track of all these permutations of studios and stuff, but like Gramercy is basically a joint venture between Polygram and Universal. And Soderbergh says, this is very interesting, that during the time they were making that film, he, he really benefited from the fact that Universal was making 
a big, big, big movie that was sucking up all the oxygen at the studio. And that film was called Waterworld. <laughs> sucking up all the land. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were drowning in, in Kevin Costner. <laughs> There's a lot of directions we can go with that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, I guess they, they needed more oxygen because they were underwater. I don't, at any rate. So basically they left him alone. He said he almost couldn't get people on the phone at the studio. Yeah. Which what a if you know what you're doing and you're having the time of your life making a, a movie, maybe that's a great thing because you're just, you, there's no studio interference. However, uh, maybe he could have used a little interference. I don't know. Mike, what did you think? watching the underneath <sighs> yeah i mean <laughs> i don't i don't know that i mean interference would have helped i mean i mean it's one of those things where i don't think anything could have saved soderbergh at this point other than the time he needed to go away and reflect and change and get back to basics which is we'll talk about in a moment so we'll talk about in the next episode in schizopolis but like there's clearly a a lack of interest. Like I said, you know, like he, you described the, the conditions. He's not in a great state of mind. He gets sent this thing and he's like, okay, sure. It's here. Let's do it. Which is kind of Soderbergh's way. You know, he just, he's like, we've talked about before as, as working writers, you know, it's like, Hey, you get offered a gig, you take it and you make it work. I don't think he was in a place to make it work because what this movie ends up being is it's, it, he tries to almost make it a sex lies replay in a sense because the drifter coming back home who's you know emotionally detached and uh um, there's a love triangle there's a love triangle like there's this personal element and and sex lies was personal to, to to soderbergh and and we should say soderbergh did write this movie like he's not credited as writing who is the I forget the name he uses as, as he uh, often so he, does. He, he takes a credit, Sam Lowry, and I believe that it was not, I believe that he was, there was some legalistic reason that he couldn't use his own name. So it's credited to Sam Lowry and Daniel Fuchs. I remember now it was a guild problem. Yeah. Um, so the pesky guild. So he was rewriting a script that somebody else had offered. Yeah. And he's, he's infusing his own personal stuff into it, clearly. The stuff that he's going through with his divorce is, is reflected into it. But what's ultimately just just looking at the movie itself and none of the context, it, it's it doesn't really succeed as either as a heist film or a personal journey. You know, like the heist gets forgotten for long periods of time. You know, you open up with that great, you know, he, he's doing the the, the triple uh, timelines, which is cool. There is cool stuff in here. And I'll talk about it in a minute. But like. The heist is so kind of forgotten, but and by the time it really kicks into gear, you know, I'll be frank, I was I was just kind of bored um, because the person. That's why I wanted to get you on here. I felt like you were dodging the question a little bit. Your personal response <laughs> watching this film. <laughs> yes, finally we're here. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I, I thought it was okay. I like some stuff that he was doing. Like the widescreen was pretty beautiful. The use of color was really cool. But at the same time, like I was just not terribly interested in in the in anything that was going on what was happening with the characters what was happening with the heist by the time they finally hatched the heist which happens in the most awkward way possible where <laughs> you know uh you know gallagher is caught by william fitchner and he's like oh i, I he squirms his way out of it by being like let's rob a, an armored car <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, i wasn't <laughs> sleeping with your wife i have a proposal for you yes. let's do a crime yeah and william fitchner's like oh Great. <laughs> Forget all the other stuff that I just fought, caught you in your house alone in the bedroom. Let's let's go do some crime. Although I, I will say that that comes from the original movie. So we, I guess if uh, Soderbergh's at fault for that, it's just for being too faithful. Oh, like, okay. Are you, well, I guess he gets to a, a bad idea. A <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there there is some... The thing that like binds together, you know, from Kafka to King of the Hill to this to underneath now, they're all competent. I mean, you can't fault the movies too hard because they're all competently made and there's some interesting stuff. The camera movement's pretty cool what he's doing. There's some cool like, you know, the 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 extreme uh, foreground focus. So there is some interesting stuff. But narratively, I really think there wasn't much of a spark to it that like would have really made the personal stuff really personal and deeper and more affecting or the heist stuff more fun or more interesting or more twisty or whatever. So ultimately, it just felt like um, 
it felt like, you know, you, when you're on the plane, you know, and you're, you're just, you're waiting to take off and you're just driving mm-hmm. around, you're just taxiing mm-hmm. and you're like, are, are we, are we driving to Florida? Like where, where are we, you know, like, <laughs> are we ever going to take off? And that's the, the movie just never took off in any way. Yeah, I think the, the word competent that you used, uh, I, I feel like competent can be used as the most damning praise there is. And and this is like fatally competent or something. It's there's almost nothing wrong with it in the way that it's made. And I kept watching it and wondering why I felt so disengaged. And I, I think that it is a great looking movie. It's a beautiful looking movie. There, it's got all sorts of uh, Soderbergh's kind of visual Flair, he's trying out the kind of color field thing where he's like using color to denote different um, passages of the film. His penchant for windows within windows. I mean, he's got he's got like windows inside houses in this one, <laughs> you know, in, in the commentary track for Sex, Lies and Videotape. He, he kind of laughs at himself for saying that he likes to, you know, he loves to shoot uh, through a window. Well, this one, he puts windows inside houses so he can shoot through windows. But I think it pays off. The visuals are, are perfect for the noir film uh, that it wants to be at some level. However, it is flat. It is slow. I mean, it's just damn slow. You just, it feels like it's, it needs 20 minutes cut out of it. But also 20 minutes added. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, as you said, as you also say, it's sort of of two minds about what, what it wants to be. If it was the more personal thing about the gambler trying to do right, it would have been more interesting. If it was just the straight up heist movie, it would have been more interesting. Instead, it tries to be both and neither really succeed. One of the things on second viewing that really struck me is that I think it suffers from some bad performances. Yeah. And, you know, I like Peter Gallagher. I think he's often, you know, a, a really good, versatile actor in different things. And I thought he was excellent in uh, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. However, he's completely miscast as Michael Chambers, the, the hero in this, or the hero, the anti-hero, the protagonist. I just never bought him as like a degenerate gambler. He's he's too pretty for one. Like like watching him meet Elizabeth Shue on a bus in the first scene of the movie, I was like, these two people are so gorgeous, they would never be on a Greyhound bus in their lives. <laughs> I've, I've spent a lot of time riding the Greyhound bus when I was younger. These, these people don't ride the bus. No. Uh, but he he just didn't have that like shifty edge. Like I just never bought him. I think Allison Elliott as Rachel was fine. Uh, William Fickner. I, I'm not sure if it's Fickner or Fitchner. I, uh, I hear both. Okay. Yes. He was like, okay. as Tommy Dundee, but it's a little bit like a one for Christopher Walken. It's, it's not, it's, it's kind of explosive when it should have been quieter and more menacing. Adam trees as David Chambers is just sort of like flat. Ugh. Like he's trying to be intense, but like I never bought him just weirdly one note. Uh, and also his role is underwritten. Like you don't buy it. Like he's supposed to turn up as, as Rachel stalker. And you're like, what? Yeah. And I wasn't even sure if they were telling the truth, you know, if she was telling the truth about, it. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I kind of bought it because at one point he's spying on them. So maybe, but yeah, maybe I he's, he's spying, spying on his, his brother. brother. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't. I had I, I lack of clarity there. Yeah. I mean, the, some of the best performances were like uh, some of the, the older vets, like Joe Don Baker is like, he's totally fine in what he's supposed to do. Paul Dooley, I like in, in most things. I think yeah. he's pretty good as as the, uh, the stepdad. I thought, uh, yeah, Elizabeth Shue was wasted. She was just a, a walking plot device. Why was she there? <laughs> you know what was the biggest waste, though? The biggest waste was uh, Shelley Duvall. What? Yeah. Oh, so few times she makes movies. And I love Shelley Duvall. So she never works anymore. Why? Why was she the nurse? What? It, it, yes. <laughs> I mean, she's there to fluff the pillows. Uh, oh, come on. That was really disappointing. It, and, it, and it almost took me out of the movie. Because if you're casting Shelley Duvall, like you need her for a reason. Yeah. I, so she's Shelley Duvall. The credits, you're like, oh, Shelley Duvall's in this. Cool. Yeah. I never get to see Shelley Duvall anymore. Yeah. And then it's, she pops up at like 20 minutes for the end to fluff the pillows. And you're like, oh, she's that's it. You know what would have been interesting is if she would have been Michael's mom, actually. Although I, I don't want to take any. I think Anjanette Comer was actually one of the better actors. Yeah, like she solid. was solid, solid mom role. Props to her. 
Um, and props to Richard Linklater uh, in his yes. cameo as the Ember Doorman. Yes, blink if you blink and you miss it. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> but a perfect for like a '90s bar that were you know really trying hard to make that a '90s bar, like the hand stamp that said like "sucker" or whatever. On yeah, it. like they're they're really trying to nail the '90s, even a ska band and everything. So we can say, in addition to, to directing a Yes concert, yes. Steven Soderbergh's also directed a ska band sequence. So I don't know what kind of music he listens to. I'd imagine not that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was actually one of the yeah the quick digression here like that was one of the things i liked about the movie even though maybe it took me out of the noiriness of it a little bit but the fact so it's filmed in austin it's it's set in austin it, it's not as good as as the other great texas neo-noir blood simple but i love that they updated the nightclub stuff and i like that they made it very contemporary and uh you know, Austin obviously has a legendary music scene and it's a, it feels like a real living, breathing live music venue. And I think that that was one of the movie's strengths. Uh, the, the cameos of the different local bands were really fun to watch, yeah. but maybe more fun than the rest of the movie. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> I was just glad Richard Linklater was there. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So anyway, it sounds like we both agree that this is our least favorite Soderbergh film so far. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I said it before. I'm not a huge fan of uh, King of the Hill, but I would probably I would put King of the Hill above this. It's got some King of the Hill's got some charm. And it's pretty beautiful. There's a lot of good stuff there that like here um, just doesn't overcome the perfect word you use flatness just doesn't get past it. Okay, so we're uh, sounds like we're in agreement on that, and we we are in good company because it's also Steven Soderbergh's <laughs> least favorite Soderbergh film so far. So we'll get into that after we take a short break. I wanted to talk to you. So the napkin should have been under my drink. No, everything makes sense. I had it all wrong, didn't I, hon? That's right. I see. I wanted to make you a business proposition. I wanted her opinion first about how best to approach you. And she suggested that you seduce her as a way to approach me. What business could we possibly have together? A job. A job. A job job? Yeah. Why come to me? You're the only crook I know. Is that polite? Tell me, what kind of a job is it, Michael, that you need a crook? Where I work. Where you work, armored cars. Welcome back to the Filmographers Podcast. Before we talk about why Steven Soderbergh hated his own film so much and exactly how on the record he is about it, let's take a look at the response when it arrived in the world back on March 10th, 1995. Mike, where were you in March 1995? <laughs> uh, I was in my sophomore year of high school. I was, I was on the sophomore uh, soccer team in my school, wishing I was on varsity. <laughs> um, <laughs> if memory serves, I was writing and is uh, still still unfinished uh, a a screenplay that was a um, very 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 heavy ripoff of uh, Kevin Smith's Clerks. Fascinating. <laughs> uh, I have to say, you make me feel old. Yeah, because where, I, where were you? Uh, I was in Missoula, Montana, uh, post-college, playing music with friends. I've got another anecdote about 1995 that I'm going to share in, in just a moment. But uh, yeah, I was actually doing a lot of screenwriting too. And I used, I was doing screenwriting on an IBM Selectric that I, I don't know where <laughs> the hell I had gotten it from. My downstairs neighbors used to say, what are you working on up there? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I believe that was around the time I, I um, completed a, a very derivative script that was uh, kind of a shoot 'em up that took place in both Chicago, which is interesting because I hadn't moved to Chicago. Whoa, I just, uh And also like rural Montana in the frozen north. And it, it had the title Coldwater Kill. 
Damn. Yeah. That's like a hard case crime novel. <laughs> <laughs> very, very much so. <laughs> Charles Ardai, if you're listening. <laughs> So it's interesting that for a film Steven Soderbergh describes as a failure, it wasn't actually a critical washout. I mean, almost nobody loved it, but it didn't get many out and out pans. Uh, and few people actually liked it. You know, Ebert gave it two and a half stars, which is the kind of like nice try rating. I mean, Ebert's generous. We all know. Yeah. He, you know, he said there's about one too many twists for my taste. I like to be fooled, but I don't like to be toyed with. Karen James from the New York Times said it was too chaotic to work as a thriller. But interestingly, she also said, even if you knew nothing about the underneath, it would be easy to see Mr. Soderbergh's fingerprints all over it, which is interesting because, you know, I think your average film goer wouldn't recognize that Soderbergh had a style yet. Yeah, it's that is I, I when I read that, I was like, really? I don't know what those fingerprints are. I don't know if Soderbergh knows what those fingerprints are yet. Like, yeah. It just I mean, I see stuff. And I'm sure you agree later that you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's doing like, you know, the time jumping and the color, like, you know, as late as, you know, out of sight, you know, which, you know, is two, two movies from now. Yep. But I don't see how like, if you like King of the Hill connects to this or, or certainly Kafka. not Kafka. <laughs> I mean, I guess <laughs> what he plays with color by having part of the film in color. <laughs> I guess. I mean, they both are made on cameras. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they employed actors in front of the cameras. Yeah. I don't know what she means. I mean, I mean, Hey, very uh, astute on her part. You yeah. Know? She's like looking into the future. I guess she knew things we didn't yet know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for the LA times, Kenneth Turan said this film is distancing too given to admiring its own shiny surface. Uh, Washington Post actually used to have two film critics and they were divided, but uh, one of them, Joe Brown, actually really liked the film. He said it was downbeat, laconically funny, arty, maybe a touch too arty. It's simmering, smoldering, low life fun, like a good episode of Twin Peaks without the self-conscious weirdness, which I thought was kind of a weird take. But I'm just sharing that to say that, yeah, some people liked it. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't. You know, it was a, maybe a financial bomb, but it wasn't like a critical bomb. Yeah, it's not a it's not, I don't think a, it's a movie that you can walk away with, really. And, and that's probably part of the problem what, is having strong feelings about it one way or the other. And that's that's part of the issue here. Um, so, yeah, I can see why people didn't outright hate it, but I don't know how you can really love this. movie yeah, either. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anybody loved, loved it and nobody hate hated it. But most people were kind of like, yeah. Certainly the box office didn't love, love it. Uh, so it was budgeted at 6.5 million. So it was a cheaper film to make than the previous two. We're seeing a little trend here. Maybe people are less willing to give him money to make, make movies with. Yeah. And out of that 6.5 million, it earned a box office of $536,023. So that is poor. And since you know I love to do the percentages, uh, percentage return on this, I calculated that it earned back 8.25% of its budget. So it lost less money than the previous films, but percentage wise, <laughs> it was the biggest failure yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're Steven Soderbergh, you find much comfort in that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And what's it? So again, you know, back to 1995 and like what's going on in 1995, the top grossing films were Batman Forever, Apollo 13, Toy Story, Pocahontas and Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. So it's not like, you know, the indies have broken the hegemony of the big studios. Um, you know, this is still a very big studio environment we're working in. Um, I my side note that I referred to earlier is this was also the year that Crimson Tide was released in May of 1995. And that's just a very special film to me because that's the film I saw on the first date with my wife, Mariah, to whom I am still married. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. So that was uh, a, a significant film cinematically. Maybe not the, the greatest submarine film, of, but a solid submarine film. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like Crimson Tide. Yeah. 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 And Mariah, I will say, this is very consistent. She loves a submarine movie. So, <laughs> you know what? I always thought, I'm not joking here, for the longest time, until recently, obviously, I, I had never seen The Underneath. I thought it was a submarine movie. It sounds, it sounds like one. Like it sounds like an aquatic thriller, <laughs> which I wish it were. <laughs> well, it certainly was underwater. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. 
So yes, anyway, while you were uh, playing high school soccer, I was about to, uh, you know, start the, the, the courtship of my wife. Wow, yeah. that's really nice. And actually, bringing it all together, that year, so about six weeks after we our first date, we went on a road trip that led us to Austin, Texas, which is where I proposed, and uh, and we became engaged. Wow, this all comes she, really. She paused briefly before she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> then you said, "I have a job, job." <laughs> yeah, a, a job, job. Armored cars, <laughs> and she was in. <laughs> I don't remember when I saw the underneath, but I don't believe it was that spring when it came out, but I'm in good company. Almost nobody saw it. Back to the, the cinematic landscape. Um, there were a couple of films made by, you know, auteur film directors, uh, people with indie roots that w did have commercial success. Um, David Fincher's Seven nearly cracked the top 10. Uh, so he's definitely, you know, uh, a, a filmmaker on the rise. And, you know, we could call that maybe an important milestone for one of Soderbergh's generational peers. Mm -hmm. uh, and a plucky little film called Pulp Fiction truly announced the arrival of Quentin Tarantino as the it boy for a whole generation of film fanboys. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, it's it's you really put these where Soderbergh is in context and it's 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 tough. Yeah, it's tough because he he definitely like these guys, I don't think would have been doing what they were doing if he hadn't made Sex, Lies and Videotape and that hadn't been such a big success. But now he's scuffling around, you know, trying to he, he, he's lost his his compass and they're coming out with these really statement movies that are electrifying film goers. Now, I know this is a podcast about Steven Soderbergh, not Quentin Tarantino, but I think this is kind of an interesting discussion because both were absolutely pivotal in the rise of Miramax and the hunger for indie bred directors who didn't necessarily go to film school, but they could not be more different in terms of their personalities or their careers. So let me put it to you, Mike. Why is it that Soderbergh has fans while Tarantino has fanboys? <laughs> you know, it, we talked about this uh, and it's something I thought about a lot. And I think this actually strikes a chord with me personally, because I, it, you know, I think artistically and personality, I think you and I are similar. And I think we're along the same wavelength as Soderbergh, if I can be so bold to say that. And just not just in terms of like who we are and we're nowhere close to Tarantino. I have a unique perspective because like working in comics, like I'm in an industry, you know, because in addition to the work I do in film, I work in comics, you know, and, and, and that industry is a lot of it has to do not only with the art, but it has to do with the collecting and not just collecting like the physical things, but collecting like knowledge and collecting status, you know, like that is one of the thing that defines like, and, and I don't love the term, but like the fanboy culture is about like obsessiveness mm. and collecting. And Quentin Tarantino is very obsessive about his collection and his movies are so often referencing so many different things that he's mentally collected, cataloged, ranked, filed, you know, all these things. It's like, it's a barometer for taste. It's like, it's like why people do best of lists at the end of the year. There's no definitive best of list. There's no real best movie, but we use those lists and we use things like it to, you know, judge our taste and, and, you know, promote our taste and judge others and obsess about what we what we think is good and what we know and what we have and our and and, and our the this this idea of like a uh, cultural uh, milestones and cultural knowledge that we've accumulated and honed and and Quentin Tarantino is like the person for that. I mean, that's why personally, I think Kill Bill is my his his worst movie. It's my least favorite because it's just nothing but a greatest hits of all the things he loves. I mean, it's it's just you know, Bruce Lee and it's Lady Snowblood and it's this and it's that. And it just like ticks off all these lists and people love that. I don't care <laughs> like, <laughs> at all. Like that, that stuff means nothing to me. And then you have Steven Soderbergh, who's like, it just doesn't display any of those qualities whatsoever. So he doesn't really, you know, he's not playing that like 
that game that Tarantino is playing, that people play that like make the best of lists and like want to have this obsessive uh, possession and ownership over stuff. And like, I know this and I love this and you don't get it. And you like, that makes me better than you kind of thing. Soderbergh is a chameleon. Like he's just doing the job, you know, like I'm sure he has things he loves. He obviously has things that yeah. he loves, but he's not centering his life. He's not defining who he is based on the things that he loves. And he's not defining his work based on the things that he loves. Like he's doing the job time in and time out. Now, granted, I love Tarantino's movies. And I think that like, once he kind of purged Kill Bill from his system and got to be a much more uh, mature filmmaker after that, I liked him a lot more. But Soderbergh doesn't have that, never did. And I'm gonna go on a limb and say he never will. That's such a fascinating answer. And you're really well positioned to answer that, I think, because of, of comics culture and, and being in the comics industry. I agree so much with what you're saying, because I think one of the things that kind of I have very mixed feelings about Tarantino, like very mixed feelings about him and his his films. I mean, he seems like the most annoying person in the world you could ever have a beer with for one. And that's fine. Exhausting. I don't ever have to have a beer with him. <laughs> but he's, a, he, you know, when he used to be make the rounds of like talk shows, he was just exhausting. He was an exhausting guest. Whatever, that's fine. Uh, I've never really cared too much about the the personality of people behind the films, but it is more the way that manifests itself in his films. And I do feel like it is like, it's almost like this test. Like, can you catch this weird reference that I threw in? And because he so revels in so much culture that I think is, you know, kind of garbage. Like, you know, like I feel like Soderbergh maybe appreciates like great filmmakers. I mean, he'll, he'll reference like a Sidney Lumet shot and say, oh yeah, I stole that from Lumet, but it's not like, could you spot the reference? It was just like, you know, he paid a little tribute in his own, his own quiet way. Yeah. Whereas, you know, um, Tarantino like consumed like ungodly gigabytes of, of like junk culture and then throws it all in there and almost dares you to like know as much about it as he does. And I just, it's just not a game I'm interested in playing. And as a, as a film goer, it kind of leaves me cold. The, uh, the book uh, Rebels on the Backlot by Sharon Waxman, it's very interesting. She's really hard on Tarantino, both personal in about his personality, which in, in some ways it, it feels like a book that wouldn't get written today because she, she kind of is like so opinionated about people's character or something like that. But um, she does make a really interesting point about him. She, she talks so much about where his ideas come from and his big ideas like how, how few of his big ideas come from him directly. She says he's a, a brilliant, gifted, genius adapter of other people's ideas. Which is not wrong. And yet he's just not, you know, an original voice per se. And maybe there's some, some uh, similarity to Soderbergh, because as the season goes on, we'll be talking about this. Soderbergh realizes that he is not a writer around this point in his career. He at first thinks he's a writer and he wrote Sex, Lies and Videotape and it's a great script. Mm -hmm. um, he's not a bad writer, but he starts to realize, you know what, maybe I'm not as gifted a writer as I am a director. And we'll, we will see that as he moves away from that and this like need to originate the idea, he actually becomes a much more assured artist and his films get markedly better. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, that self-awareness like really took him a long way amongst other things. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you. Like, I just think that he is, it's, it's about the craft. He's just not playing the game, you know, that Tarantino is playing and that if you don't play that, and that's something I've struggled with, like I said, in comics, because I don't do it either. And I'm not, I, I, I know comic writers who do and they get more attention because they're playing this sort of game and they're so indebted, you know, so embedded in that culture of, 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 I keep using the word, but I can't think of, of obsessiveness and, yeah. and knowing things, you know, and I don't, I, that's not what I do. Um, and Soderbergh's just about the craft. Like you said, like the things he's going to talk about, he's like, oh, he's talking about the Sidney Lumet shot, or he's talking about Don Siegel or whatever, you know, and like, it's just subtle. And he's not even really making a point to show it off. He's just in a pinch and he's like, uh, well, <laughs> what will Lumet do? <laughs> As we all ask ourselves on a regular basis. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, th I think that's fascinating stuff, and I'm glad I asked you that question because I, I I really appreciate your answer and, and your your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I think ultimately, like it feels like Tarantino is kind of making a club, and you know, if you are obsessive like him, you want to join that club and you want to track down all this stuff. Um, you know, I to me, um, obviously, Tarantino has 
legions of fans and his films, some of them are great. Some of them are less great. Uh, he's obviously super important, but to me, Soderbergh is ultimately a far more accessible filmmaker to far more people. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I, this is about a year or two ago. Um, my friends and I had a, we have a long standing movie telegram uh, chat. And we, the question was asked, it might have been by me, I don't remember, but you know, Desert Island, what would you take with you, the films of Tarantino or the films of Steven Soderbergh? This is a true story. And I won't tell you the, all the results, but I will tell you that Steven Soderbergh came to the island with me. <laughs> 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 and I waved goodbye to the shore to Tarantino. Yeah, and stuff. absolutely. Well, I think you're stuck in a desert island. It could be a little aggressive, like just having to rewatch Tarantino <laughs> films over and over yeah, again. Yeah, you know, I'll have Inglorious Bastards in my memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I rewatched Pulp Fiction not that long ago to show it to uh, one of my kids, and I honestly couldn't finish it. I, I couldn't. I couldn't connect with it. And that's a film I loved when it came out. Like, like a lot of, you know, young aspiring, you know, filmmakers, like I loved that movie when it came out, absolutely loved it. But I revisiting it at this age, I couldn't finish it. Well, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Huh? Well, season two is not Tarantino. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Quentin, you'll live. <laughs> Well, when we come back, we'll talk about the necessity of failure to artistic growth, something I know a whole lot about. I can't say that I would recommend it to anyone other than to, to look at it in the context of, of a career and that it actually fulfilled a very important um, function for me because I was so unhappy coming out of it that I decided I needed to radically alter my way of working. So in a way I needed to, you know, to borrow a phrase, I needed to bottom out um, in order to rebuild. Mike, let's get personal for a moment. What do you think was your greatest artistic failure? <laughs> <laughs> Going right, right for it. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, I feel like I should be laying down on a couch for this. <laughs> like a 90s, you know, psych there is session. <laughs> no, you know, I, I, I actually know what it is because I, I live with it and I'm so acutely aware and as a as a person working in the arts i'm sure you know this i i dwell on my failures far more than i think about my success yes um, indeed yeah that's that's how it goes but uh yeah there's a book that i did and, I, and i'm not going to name uh what it what it is a a comic book that i did and nothing worked it's just one of those things where nothing worked and i don't want to if anybody like reads you know, in between the lines and figures out what book I'm talking about. I apologize to my creative partners because it wasn't their fault. It was just a book that I thought was good in my head. And I like the people I work with, uh, which made it even all the more worse because I got about midway through scripting it. And I just realized this is just going to go bad. This is just not where I want it to be. And the feeling kept getting just worse and worse because um, I was pursued for this by this kind of nascent publisher who were very, very kind and generous people. They put their trust in me and it's not like I consciously did bad work, but I think I was doing too much work at the time. I was just maybe lacked a little bit of focus. And the result was not good. It, it didn't do that well critically. The sales were not good. Um, we there was a weird printing error that you know just it was just one of those things that just not, like Murphy's law, like everything could go wrong, went wrong. And um, yeah, even talking about it, I still feel terrible about it. Yeah. What did you learn from it? You know, <clears throat> it's funny because that was one of the breaking points of my uh, career because right at the same time, um, I pitched, uh, there was this other new publisher called Vault, who I ended up now have a long standing career with. Um, they're, they're some of my best partners and good friends. Um, and I, at the same time this book was coming out, the one that I mentioned, I pitched them a book and they were like, they didn't really publish anything yet. And wow. I pitched them this series that ultimately didn't get it. They rejected it and didn't come back, but they rejected my pitch. And I was like, 
how dare you? Because <laughs> I was Don't pursued. you know who I am? <laughs> well, it was weird because I was like, I was pursued by them as well and they hadn't done anything and I was coming off like a hot image book and I was like, you know, I was making strides and, and the editor was like, I'm sorry, man, this isn't good <laughs> enough. And I was like, oh, you're right. You're right. This isn't good enough, you know? And I, I had to really reflect. I had that, that quote from Soderbergh, having to burn it down to, to build it back up again, was really essential. Like I had to really step back and realize some of the problems that I had, and I can get into that in a long time, like what I was doing creatively that is just, just a little bit off. And resulting was, was came out of that was Wasted Space, um, which is, I think, to me, my favorite book. Uh, you know, Barbaric is great and really successful and it's neck and neck, but Wasted Space, because it holds such a, a personal spot in my heart, because there would be no Barbaric without Wasted Space. It's it's my favorite thing. It may be my best thing, but it was all resultant of, you know, really needing to, you know, get knocked down a bit and knocked up and not knocked up. <laughs> <laughs> knocked around. What are you telling us? <laughs> um, <laughs> It's your baby, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> to turn into an cross. episode of uh, Maury Povich real quick. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Soderbergh's right. Sometimes you have to take a wrecking ball to things and start over, you know, because you get lost. You know, like he said himself, you can get a little degrees off course and all of a sudden you're in the middle of an ocean uh, and you just don't know what to do. Uh, but I'm sure, uh, I don't say I'm sure, I'm assuming you've had experiences like that as well, I hope to make me feel better cure <laughs> no everything i do pretty much works out the way i intended and then yeah. you know, it's just success to success you publish uh, your first drafts right first drafts <laughs> that's right oh my god yeah it's, it, it's funny because i i really wanted to hear from you on that but then i was trying to turn that around on myself and, and think about what i would choose and it was really difficult because so many failures um i mean i would say of the the books i published uh I don't, I don't think any of them are failures. Uh, you know, my first book, which is published under a pen name has a million things wrong with it, but most first books do. Um, my second book better, third book, a little bit worse, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's two, two steps forward, one step back, I think is, is the way a lot of us learn. I, but the, the thing that really occurred to me, was, I think the biggest failure for me was something that nobody saw. Uh, I, was granted sabbatical. I used to work, uh, I was a magazine editor, but I worked for a not-for-profit and they actually allowed sabbatical. So you can wow. get some paid time off to pursue creative work, which is just a freaking gift. I, um, I didn't even know um, that people who weren't professors could do that. So I was granted sabbatical to, to work on a book. And um, I can't remember what the deal was. I think I got like half pay for, four months or something like that. It was just amazing, absolutely amazing. And I, I was like so excited because I had young kids and it had been a struggle to find much time to write. So I was really just planning to, to dig in and work and get a ton done. And I had an idea and our mutual friend, Daniel Krause, had really encouraged me to take a big swing. And I, you know, I, I was feeling very fired up. I had a big idea, but I, it wasn't a very well thought through idea. And I was so keyed up on creating, on generating pro progress on this novel that I was writing faster than I should have. I should have, there were some basic things about it that I just didn't figure out ahead of time. I didn't, we, you know, we've talked about finding the story. I hadn't fully found the story. I had a lot of ideas and I thought that because I was being really ambitious, it would be okay that, you know, I would... You know, it would be a complex novel. There'd be a lot to read into it. And I was going to figure it out as I went along. And there's still some things I like about this book, but I wrote 50,000 words, which is for people who don't know, like that's a, that's half of a good length novel. Wow. And I couldn't bring myself to reread it late, like now, if you wanted me to, um, I didn't have the story. It was a series of events that. I mean, it wasn't like a plotless thing. Like it, it was, it was going to cohere into a book, but there was nothing really thematically tying it together in the way I wanted. And it just was a mess. It was a hot mess. And it was so frustrating to be given that gift of time and the trust of people to, to really, you know, do something of value and to feel like I had just kind of failed. And I was so disheartened that, you know, for a few years, I kept thinking like I was going to pull it 
I was going to take it down and go through it again and figure out what was wrong and fix it. And for some reason, it just had the stench of failure. And so it still just kind of sits there taunting me on my hard drive. <laughs> yeah, it's hard when you have those feelings that tied to tied to something, it's hard to really see past them. I, 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 I just don't know how you do it. Yeah. But the thing I learned from that was really valuable, which was just like, slow the hell down. Don't be in such a headlong rush. You know, I see these writers on social media all the time who are doing these like, what do they call it? Like um, sprint, word sprint, writing sprint, something like that. Oh, yeah, the November. Uh, or NaNoWriMo. <laughs> and, you know, bless you if that works for you. But for me, that will that's never going to work for me. And I'm never going to start a stopwatch and say, hey, writing sprint, a thousand words in 60 minutes or something like that. Because to, that just seems like a weird accumulation of words. I am an outliner and um, I've ever since that failure, I've been very careful to, you know, have some sort of an outline, whether it's a beat sheet or whether it's a fully fledged outline that's like 20,000 words, that's like a little mini novella. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm careful to understand thematically what I'm going for. And that all may change, but it's like you need to set your destination. If you, if you plan to arrive anywhere, you need to know where you're going. Right. And um, so I've never, again, sat down to just sort of see where my creativity will take me. So I have one question for you. Do you get bothered? Do deadlines bother you? Because I, I understand that feeling of like, oh, I'm, the pressure of I have four months, I have to yeah. make. I have to make the most of it. I have to come out of the other side of this with something great, you know? But do, do deadlines bother you in the same way? I love deadlines, actually. I, I love deadlines. I love assignments. Um, you know, it's something I talk about a lot with my, my co-writing a lot. Like, I enjoy having a project brought to me. I just have to make sure I do all my homework before I really dig in. I see. Um, but I can... It's kind of energizing to me to feel like, hey, there's, a, there's an end point to this. I think that I would struggle again, given all the time in the world, you know, somebody, somebody says, here's, here's uh, a daily living wage or whatever, you know, basic minimum income. And you've got all the time in the world and you can write whatever the hell you want. Some people that's heaven. I, it might be hell for me. Yeah. I mean, and I think we're going to talk about this in a second. It's interesting because like, I can't live in a project for too long. Yeah. Like I can't, like, I just, I need to like get in, uh, and I do same thing you do. I do my prep work. I outline. I, I'm really big into that, thoroughly knowing before I go and actually write it, whether it's a comic script, a screenplay, whatever. Like the when I'm actually you know writing, you know, it, it's usually uh, I'm that's I'm nearing the end at that point because I've already figured everything out. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to live in projects for too long. I can't obsess and be in there for yeah that, that stretch of time. I just, I, I don't know if it's like I lose interest or I lose steam or whatever, but like, I'm more of a get in, do the job and get out. I mean, and that's the perfect segue back to Soderbergh, right? Because that is clearly the kind of person he is, you know, he's, he's lining up his next project while he's making one, he was lining up a quiz show while he was making King of the Hill, yeah. you know, as opposed to your, you know, Finchers or your Tarantino's where everything's got to be just right and the stars have got all the line, you know, like Tarantino famously threw away a screenplay because it had been leaked and he just said, well, I, I just can't make it now because I have to, you know, surprise everybody. Y you know, you, you've told some hilarious anecdotes about Fincher's perfectionism. You know, I I think for, for some people, you know, that can result in these, you know, Wellesian masterpieces or these Kubrickian masterpieces or something. And if that's your working style, great. But on, when I think about these directors, I don't think of particularly happy people, right? No. Doing <laughs> 80, 87 takes, taking, you know, five years to make a movie or like whatever. Yeah, boy, is everybody thrilled when that when you're on that set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas Soderbergh, he approaches them more like a professional. Um, he seems to like to have you know, pretty happy sets where people are, you know, he people come back to work with him again. So that's a good sign. Um, I always think these directors who have kind of a core group of collaborators with whom they've developed an easy familiarity, like that's just a good sign that they're they're fun to work with. Um, but he's, yeah, he's clearly somebody who's willing to fail. Yeah. And then the fail is like, is less pressure too. Like I, if I spent, you know, thousands of takes and X amount of months and months and months on a project, the way like a Fincher does, or the way like, you know, like a Kubrick does, and it doesn't work out. 
I don't know that I would ever recover, you know, because you're still, you're setting up the next thing and you're so far away from the next thing that like, I don't know how you survive that desert. The way Soderbergh's like, I'm on to the next thing I'm working and there's stuff releasing and I'm producing and whatever. But like, it's kind of almost softens the blow of failure and, and failure is inevitable for everyone. Yeah. That, and that's such a great point because if you, if you, the, you know, it's almost like there's some business cliche or something like fail better or you know, whatever, but you know, it's like if, if you, if you make more work, a failure is not going to sting you as much and it may not hurt you as much. You know, we, I don't want to minimize the crisis of confidence that Soderbergh was having on the making of the underneath because talking about, it, he said, quote, to sit on a movie set at age 31 and wonder whether or not you even want to do this, having no other real skills is so terrifying and depressing. <laughs> and I thought back too to this anecdote he tells um, about being a, a baseball player when he was a kid. He was apparently, as you said in the first episode of this podcast, a very good baseball player when he was a kid. Yeah. Until a pretty young age though, like age 12 or something like that, he suddenly overnight didn't have it anymore. He he couldn't pitch. He went out and got shelled. He he lost his confidence at the plate. And that interestingly kind of led into his, you know, rebirth as, as a filmmaker because his dad then, you know, started pushing him towards the arts and then eventually he became a, a filmmaker. But I have to wonder, was he on that set having that same crisis of confidence thinking like, I lost all my ability to do this thing that I'm great at. Is that happening to me again? Like it's right. very possible he might not have been able to pick himself up from this, but instead he was already planning his next move. Yeah. And he actually said that. I don't know if you read this. I don't forget where I saw this interview or something where he did have that crisis, but he said it was the same thing as that. Only I knew I could get it back. Where in okay. baseball, he knew he, he, he was done, you know, which is um, so fascinating. I'm, I'm not a person who believes in talent. You know, yeah. I believe it's talent is passion plus hard work equals talent. But there is something, it's hard for me to deny there's something mystical because that is true. Like you've had in projects I've had in my life in various times where you had something, a feeling, a sensation, whatever, and then it's gone. And then it's gone forever. And I don't know what that thing is. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating that you, I didn't know that interview, but that makes perfect sense. And, and so how great that he at least knew he could get past it again. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to put in a plug at this, at this moment for the uh, legendary DVD extra on King of the Hill, because so the underneath <laughs> it's, it's so hilarious. The, the entire film, the underneath is a DVD extra on King of the Hill. <laughs> it's just tucked in there, <laughs> but on a DVD extra of that DVD extra, there's a 20, 25 minute interview with Soderbergh where if it's not legendary, it should be legendary. He's talking about the underneath and he's talking about it so bluntly. I mean, once again, he anticipates all of our criticisms before we have even articulated them. He almost seems to feel them more strongly than we do. He obviously states them more eloquently than we can. Um, but he, it's, it's just, an, it's amazing. It's like, he almost, he acknowledges how, how bad it must feel for someone who worked on these films with him. Well, this film with him, the underneath to hear him talking about how he was just mentally checked out. But he also talks about how incredibly necessary it was. If you're interested in Soderbergh at all, if you're enjoying this podcast at all, I just highly recommend that you, you check that out. This, you know, you may or may not want to watch the underneath, but dig up that um, that commentary, a 20 to 25 minute interview um, where he really it's, it's just fascinating to hear an artist talk about his own work like this. It, you know, it's almost like the guy is deeply introspective and learns from his mistakes because he's not defensive about his failures. Yes. Wow. That's really <laughs> That's really good. That's true. That's true. I mean, that's, it also is a great commentary to listen to, to hear him say, uh, you know, the, whomever the director of can called and was like, Hey, Steven, well, you know, you've got, we hear you have a new movie. Do you want to play? It? And he's like, no, it's not any good. <laughs> <laughs> he turned down can. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, let's take another break and we'll be back with more. It's a beautiful film. 
film to look at. I think the score is really beautiful. Um, but 15 seconds in, I know we're in trouble because of how fucking long it takes to get through those credits. We've been so critical of the last three movies that I'm a little worried <laughs> some of our listeners might be wondering why they should revisit the early films of Soderbergh. I do want to say that I really think it's been worthwhile, even if I had to force myself to watch the underneath again yesterday. Uh, let's, let's end on a positive note and just talk about some of the developing themes and techniques that we see that will pay off in future films, because there are some terrific films just around the corner. There are, we promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what, were you, what are you seeing here? Well, I mean, uh, one, one thing, this is not really a theme necessarily, but you know, let's, let's celebrate the fact that this is Steven Soderbergh's first heist movie, right? True. Uh, that has to count for something, uh, even though at the time he asked himself, what the hell am I doing here making an armored car <laughs> heist movie? <laughs> He, he did also say that, you know, in his in his existence uh, as a human and as a film fan, that he did like heist films. Um, so, you know, even though this one didn't come off, this obviously kind of whetted his appetite or this will come back as something, you know, an itch he wanted to scratch later. You know, he obviously has made one of the most successful heist franchises of all time yeah. and kind of ushered in a renaissance, if you want to call it that, or maybe just a copycat assance of uh, heist movies, you know, and he, the Oceans series weren't even the only heist things he did. Um, so I, let's, let's say that that's, you know, something we can kind of put a pin in it, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's his first heist movie. That's, that's something, right? <laughs> um, you know, part of it, if I'm being like critical, uh, it's like, he is a very competent director looking for a voice, you know, mm -hmm. it seems mm -hmm. to be the thing. But then again, this is the this is the beauty of Steven Soderbergh. It's like, what is that voice? You know, because like you can look at these movies and if they had hit, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation because they are kind of following the Soderberghian pattern of him be unable to be defined that he does this one thing or has this like a Tarantino or has this one style of making movie. You can turn on a Tarantino mm -hmm. movie and you're like, yeah, this is a Tarantino movie. You, you, you see it or finch. Eight a minute monologue by Samuel L. Jackson. It's a Tarantino movie. Right. A lot of feet. <laughs> it's a Tarantino movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like this is, this is laying down the pattern of who he is, you know, like, taking chances and, 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 and you know what? Enduring, I think is big because he is going to hit some valleys to, you know, despite his massive successes that we all know, there are some things in there, some projects that didn't work and, you know, arguably should have worked. You can argue that King of the Hill should have worked. I think that was mismarketed. I think that was probably a movie that should have done better than it did. Agreed. You do see the beginnings of that pattern of like, there is no pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, uh, as he's alluded, the, like not only did the failures kind of teach him that he could pick himself up and do it again and, and that he needed to make films more in his own way, but they just taught him that you can survive failure. And that's that's something very important that, that we all need in an artistic career, uh, not to be defined by a single failure. Uh, he's also just, you know, polishing his technical technique. He's always been a technically good filmmaker. I think some people don't like the way his films may be lit or something at times because he does do things experimentally, you know, like later where we'll talk about traffic, how he lights, you know, using source lighting or, um, you know, sometimes he'll, he'll expose negatives in a weird way to achieve an effect, but that's an artistic choice. Um, he's, he's got the ability technically to work the camera himself. Um, uh, as we'll discuss in the next episode, you know, he's, it's like, he's kind of apprenticing as a director. He's learning how to, to manage a budget. He's learning how to manage stars. He's learning how to, um, deal with it when a film doesn't do well. He's learning how to deal with studio neglect or studio interference. He's learning to deal with, you know, big Hollywood egos like Robert Redford. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, all good points for sure. And he comes out maintaining his sense of humor. That's important. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's he's just so honest. He's he and I feel like he's honest with himself. It's like you said, you know, like that it just enables him to grow. And 
he does continue to grow. And I think he's growing still, you know, he's still doing interesting things now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's going to be so much stuff to talk about this season. I mean, he, you know, at a point in his career when he absolutely could have been coasting, you know, what he makes a movie on an iPhone. I mean, that's just, he, he's a, he's a guy who wants to tell stories and push himself. And uh, yeah, even though he was at a creative low with the underneath, uh, he, with a, within a few short years, he was able to look back at these first four films and really put them in perspective of his own career and, and take lessons from them that would, would pay off. And the next film we're going to be talking about is, um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about Soderbergh's fifth film, which may at the time have seemed like a career suicide note, but which turned out to provide this creative spark that reignited his career. Yeah, it does indeed. Yeah, Skip, Schizopolis is going to be fascinating to talk about. And I think, I think people are going to be surprised by the discussion because I don't think it's going where people think. Uh, having, having gotten your notes, it, it certainly is not going to go the way I expect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, strap in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and take a moment to give us a good rating or review on the platform of your choice. Even better, tell a film-loving friend to join us on our journey to watch all of the films of Steven Soderbergh. You can follow us on Instagram, at The Filmographers, or on X, at Filmographer Pod. And special thanks to Kevin Lau, our producer, Gompson, who composed our theme music, and Cosmo Graf, who designed our logo. If you have feedback, suggestions, or just want to share a fun Soderbergh fact, email us at thefilmographerspodcast at gmail.com. Join us next week on the Filmographers Podcast for an all-inclusive stay at Steven Soderbergh's Schizopolis. Schizopolis.